Naturally, the first question anybody would ask is why would a young, handsome, well-educated man from liberal New England would come all the way to the ultra-conservative Bible Belt of the South to make a career for himself? Magnolia was in a legislated dry county that my friends had to drive a good 45 minutes to an hour to buy a six-pack of beer. And they were not even allowed to drink on campus. My philosophy teacher's introduction of himself was a lesson in itself. He and his wife had a two-year-old daughter, and they had decided that it is best to raise her in a conservative environment, away from the excessively liberal attitudes of New England. Perhaps to underscore and, elab and elaborate the thinking behind such sentiments, in addition to the standard text recommended by the university, he also recommended a second text for the class. The book was an anthology of essays by the historian and philosopher Sir Isaiah Berlin entitled The Proper Study of Mankind. Some 650 odd pages in length, the size of the book was intimidate, intimidating to say the least, not to mention that I struggled to understand much of its content. A couple of years later, I picked up the book again, and by then I had been sufficiently exposed to the socio-political dynamics of the Western world that I was able to grasp the depth of Berlin's essays. Today, I can say that no other book has helped me understand human history and the evolution of thought than this book. Essays such as The Pursuit of the Ideal, The Concept of Scientific History, Historical Inevitability, From Hope and Fear Set Free, The Hedgehog and the Fox have contributed above par to the shaping of the frame of mind that made writing the Don, Su Don Su Rock My World possible. That it is only fitting that I share with you an inspiring passage from the pursuit of the ideal. I quote, when I was young, I read War and Peace by Tolstoy much too early. The real impact on me of this great novel came only later, together with that of other Russian writers both novelists and social thinkers of the mid-19th century. These writers did much to shape my outlook. It seemed to me, and it still does, that the purpose of these writers was not principally to give realistic accounts of the lives and relationships to one another of individuals or social groups or classes, not psychological or social analysis for its own sake. Although, of course, the best of them achieve precisely this, incomparably. Their approach seemed seem to me to essentially moral. They were concerned most deeply with what was responsible for injustice, oppression, falsity in human relations, imprisonment, whether by stonewalls or conformism, unprotesting submission to man-made yokes, moral blindness, egoism, cruelty, humiliation, servility, poverty, helplessness, helplessness bitter indignation, despair on the part of so many. In short, they were concerned with the nature of these experiences and their roots in the human condition. The condition of Russia in the first place, but by implication of all mankind. And conversely, they wished to know what could bring about the opposite of this, a reign of truth, love, honesty, justice, security, personal relations based on the possibility of human dignity, decency, independence, freedom, spiritual fulfillment. Some, like Tolstoy, found this in the outlook of simple people, unspoiled by civilization. Like Rousseau, he wished to believe that the moral universe of peasants was not unlike that of children, not distorted by the conventions and institutions of civilization, which sprang from human vices. Greed, egoism, spiritual blindness, that the world could be saved if only men saw the truth that lay at their feet. If they but looked, it was to be found in the Christian Gospels, the Sermon on the Mount. Others among these Russians put their faith in scientific rationalism or in social and political revolution founded on a true theory of historical change. Others again looked for answers in the teachings of the orthodox theology or in liberal Western democracy or in a return to ancient Slav values obscured by the reforms of Peter the Great and his successors. 
What was common to all these outlooks was the belief that solutions to the central problems existed, that one could discover them and with sufficient selfless effort realize them on Earth. They all believed that the essence of human beings was to be able to choose how to live. Society, societies could be transformed in the light of true ideals believed in with enough fervor and dedication. If, like Tolstoy, they sometimes thought that man was not truly free, but determined by factors outside his control, they knew well enough, as he did, that if freedom was an illusion, it was one without which one could not live or think. None of this was part of my school curriculum, which consisted of Greek and Latin authors, but it remained with me. Berlin's early environment, close quote, sorry. Berlin's early environment in pre-communist Russia had already grounded him in the social consciousness of the great Russian writers. By the time his family fled to Great Britain to escape persecution in Russia, his core values had already been formed. The luminous core of his writings, without a doubt, originates from the fact that he saw the best and, best and worst world, sorry, best and worst of both worlds during his formative years. It is this understanding that my philosophy teacher wanted to exercise with regard to his own little daughter, that values can be better shaped in a conservative environment. And that is, and that is one important theme that I have tried to highlight in my first publication as well. I have always felt that while I went to the United States to study how to program machines to think like human beings, the greatest education I received was an understanding of how human beings can be and in fact are being programmed to think like machines. I too was an innocent victim of such conditioning at first, but thanks to the values inculcated in me by my family, I was soon able to see through it all and free myself. Therefore, let me first thank my parents, Professor Dayala Abhisekar and Shanta Abhisekar, and my grandmother, the late Gladys Abhisekar, for shaping my socially conscious outlook of life that forms the basis of this publication. I would like to thank Dr. Eti Ariratna for agreeing to grace this special occasion as chief guest. It is truly an honor. Thank you, Mrs. Shamara Ransirini, for finding the time in her busy schedule to introduce the book at the launch. That was a superb introduction I could have ever hoped for. I would like to thank my sisters, Nadunika and Nalinika, and my brother, Lakma. My sister and brother are not here, they're in Australia, so they send their blessings from Australia, I'm sure. For their love and support, and for making me realize that unity in the family is only possible with the foundation of unconditional love. To my uncle, Aditya Besekar, the chairman of Aspirations Education, thank you for allowing me the flexible work schedule over the past year in order to complete this book. It is much appreciated. A big thank you to Ms. Tarindra de Silva for her constant words of encouragement and unstinting support in fine-tuning the book and making it ready for publication. Thank you, Kasid Bukta, for nailing the book cover on first design itself and for designing this wonderful website. Unfortunately, Kasid could not be here this evening as he is on, a, on his first Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. I'm sure he too sends his blessings from there. I would like to thank Sarasavi Publishers for coming forward to publish my maiden, maiden book. Finally, I would like to thank every single one of you, present or not, who helped me in numerous ways to make my fun dream a reality. Thank you once again. I would like you to, all of you, to have some refreshments over there. And uh, thank you all for coming in. Thank you. Thank you.